This is the Block A Pinball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Freebus, a.k.a. Shut Your Trap. Joining me as always, halfway across the world, Jared Morgan. Well, hello, everybody. How's it going today? It's not a weekend. <laughs> right? It's not the uh, usual day. We're doing a midweek, and there's a reason for that. Joining us also right now, uh, just in the northern side of my state, Mel Kirk from uh, Zen Studios. What's going on, Mel? Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for changing up your normal schedule. I appreciate it. And uh, good to be here again. Well, it's really easy for us to change our schedule right now is we're both home mm. for the most part. We're both working <laughs> from home. It's, it's not doubt at all at the moment. <laughs> I imagine uh, you usually what uh, lately has been the, the issue with us not being able to get a hold of you is because of all the shows and uh, you know places, the, the, the trade shows that you've been going to. And I, you had two that were coming up that obviously have been uh, eliminated for the time being. Yeah, actually, I was so I was supposed to be in Europe end of February, all the way through the middle of March, right until GDC, um, and then from GDC, uh, I was going. I for, I forgot what was going on, but and then E3, of course, out there in the future. But all of that's been was wiped off and, and canceled, and uh, so I've been parked at home for a while now, like the longest stretch in probably the last ten years, um, which I'm finding to be quite enjoyable under these circumstances. But <laughs> like. No flights, books. That might be the first time in the in the last 15 years I don't have anywhere I'm scheduled to go right now. Um, I think we're all kind of in this same situation. Because you guys were going to be promoting. I know that uh, I kept on seeing Twitter posts regarding both Operancia coming to multiple platforms and then also, uh, was it Dreadnoughts? Yeah, Operancia is launching on multiple platforms next Tuesday. That's the 31st ride. Here's the weird thing, too, is like days are all bleeding together. I don't, I, today is Thursday. I was reminded that today is Thursday. But <laughs> it could have been Saturday or Tuesday. I don't know. Um, so I have to keep reminding myself of actual dates now instead of like Tuesday, Monday. But yeah, the 31st is Operencia. Dread Nautical is April 29th. Um, and that's across, that's a multi-platform launch as well. So, uh, and that was pretty much what the trade show stuff was going to be, I imagine, was going to be your focus with Zen Studios. Yeah, I think so. Um, and it's interesting now because we have more staff um, and we have a marketing team and all these things that we never used to have. So they plan to go to events and shows and like I, I may or may not be going to though. I'm, I'm usually doing BD or strategic kind of things. And um, But I know that we did a DreamHack event in LA where we had we had a pinball machine and we were showing up Rencia. That was actually, that event happened and that was like the last one. After that, everything got cut off. But um, then there was... During GDC, there were supposed to be some game showcases for Dreadnautical. That that got canceled. It moved to an online edition um, at uh, on on Steam where we had like demos live and stuff. But everything's going digital. Um, the event presence for now is down. We are locked down. Yeah, the... I've definitely seen that trend moving towards digital everything. Even in the space I'm working in, in technical writing, all the conferences are going virtual. I actually think it's awesome because people like me can't get to the US. <laughs> and it actually opens up the world a lot more. You know what's interesting? Uh, I met a guy. So I was at DICE in Vegas in February. And uh, that's kind of the like the executive conference for the, for the game industry. Um, and met a guy, uh, Mark Sullivan, I believe was his name, from Fast Company. And he ended up interviewing me. So I was in Fast Company uh, for it was a line about what events mean to the game industry. And the whole thing is like, actually, it's kind of better for everybody because now everyone's going to do their talks and just post them straight online and everyone can have access. And we can share information faster. So maybe there is something to this, you know? Um, yeah. I don't know. So I'm going to get this out of the way to uh, just right off the bat, since we're talking about Amperencia and uh, Dead Nautical. Um <laughs> because obviously there's been a gap between uh, table releases. Uh, we're still in that gap. You guys said probably May or June is when the next pack would be uh, dropping. Um, but I know this, and you've told us this before, but I just want to kind of uh, clarify it for those that are curious. Uh, you guys working on those two games in no way diminishes the work on the pinball uh, side of things because it's almost two different divisions, correct? Yeah, and it's actually, you know, there's pinball and non-pinball, and you know, I'll just kind of say it again. We, we're actually, I mean, we're a multi-project studio now. Um, back in the day, we only worked on pinball, and that was all we did, and that was great. Um, and then we, we, we've grown over time, and we've launched other games, and 
So we have three non-pinball projects. These are all fully featured games, Operencia, Dreadnautical, and Castlestorm 2, which has been announced and will ship sometime. Those are all their own teams. They operate um, completely independently of pinball. And the pinball team uh, itself is incredibly busy right now. It's uh, We're busier than ever. We're in a major uh, console generation transition happening. Everyone knows Xbox 5 or <laughs> PS5. Xbox <laughs> Series X are all coming. The names, right? Um, uh, there's new there's new platforms for people to play on. There's like Apple Arcade and there's Stadia. Um, all these places, you know, um, it's totally reasonable to think that games should be shipping on those at some point soon and that there might be a slowdown on current gen. So, you know, the, the things that if you just look through uh, the history of, the, of our cadence of releases, I think you'll find that we're in a similar situation. It's funny, too, because I think about, it's like, it's real easy for us to just go, well, just come on, put it out. But then it's like, well, you try running a company sometime and uh, seeing <laughs> all the moving pieces that need to go and get involved and, uh, you know, and the marketing and the strategy of, of when to release and making sure everybody knows it's releasing and everything. It's like, you can't just go, hey, here you go. <laughs> yeah, it's my responsibility to, you know, to look at the big picture and, and to make sure that we're set up for long-term success. At times, that, that's going to mean that we're not shipping a quarterly pinball uh, pack for everybody, um, and that's perfectly okay because uh, working on larger initiatives, you know, uh, is proving to be very good for us. Like Star Wars Pinball and Nintendo Switch last year was a rather big project. It was a great payoff, um, and it was, it was really well-received, super high-quality content. We're all proud of it. Um, but, like, taking the approach of, like, big, meaty things that we can really – uh, build on and set us up for future success are important. Um, and those, we have to balance those with like a, a quarterly DLC release or even a, you know, bi-quarterly DLC. So, um, you know, there's no shortage of pinball content in the pipeline. I think we're going to surprise and delight uh, people uh, in the soon and in the not too distant future. Um, so yeah, just bear with us. I'm kind of curious with the, with the switch, uh, obviously, Williams Pinball had been out prior to the Star Wars uh, titles dropping, and then that came out in both you know physical and digital versions. Was there? Did you guys see a huge spike in uh, Switch uh, downloads? Um, and did that translate not just in Williams tables, but also all the old, uh, the older Zen originals that were uh, available? Yes, uh, Star Wars Pinball on Nintendo Switch. Kind of, I mean, Pinball FX3 was doing really well on Switch. It, it always has. It continues to this day. But we have seen a lift um, in Pinball FX3 activity since uh, Star Wars Pinball Switch came. So th that game works uh, to our advantage to bring people into saying, hey, Pinball is a game I enjoy on, on Nintendo Switch. Where can I get more? And uh, we definitely saw a lift. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah, it is. Um, we're basically, I'd call it about a year and a half into... Uh, basically from the time you announced Williams Pinball to having tables released um, and, you know, up to this point. Um, and I kind of wanted to take this moment in between these uh, release cycles to just kind of reflect back on this past year and a half and what that's been like for the studio. Um, it's kind of what the, the focus that we're going to be doing here since we have your attention. Um, <laughs> the the, the, the kind of the, one of the big things that I was just curious about, though, was just what were some of the bigger challenges with, uh, with making the Williams tables? Um, that Zen faced in general. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, you can't really work on these games without having uh, an actual machine uh, to, to take apart and to model. Um, so one of the challenges is just, uh, and, well, luckily in Budapest, we have the, the pinball museum there, um, which has a lot of games. And one of the things that I found out during this whole thing is back in the, the day, um, pinball was so popular in Hungary because that was kind of the only thing they had for entertainment during uh, the Russian uh, occupation. They didn't have Nintendo. They didn't have these other things. So they had a lot of pinball, but they had the highest pinball machine per capita of anywhere in the world for like 20 years. <laughs> and that was a really, really interesting fact. Um, so we've been able to get our hands on the machines, but that was one of the challenges is like, uh, okay, we have a machine, but it's really broken down and this thing's been played a lot. There's no replacement parts. How should it play? Um, <laughs> and so we try to fix, fix it, fix it up ourselves to try to get a Good simulation because we're, we're trying to simulate what is really happening right there in front of us at that time and you all know no two pinball machines play the same no they don't <laughs> <For> sure 
I think <laughs> oftentimes that's the the reason of conjecture in the community about how something plays. They everyone just needs to realize that that everything if they're a physical beast and therefore they are going to play differently depending on where they are, how they're set up, and it's really what Williams Pinball seems to be to me is it's the the Zen Studios configuration of that particular pinball machine, and people just need to realize that. <laughs> I can tell you. That is true. <laughs> the way that our machines play in our office and at the uh, the Budapest Pinball Museum, if you go and like play those and then you play the game, I think that you're going to be like, oh yeah, it is. They do did it right. They, like they did it right. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we we were always saying that, and me and Jared both pointed out to Creature from the Black Lagoon as the prime source of this, because um, I was in a pinball league and it seemed like everybody had those at their homes, and I played four different machines of creature not a single one of them played identical and like big differences uh just in terms of you'd launch the ball and how just that long arc coming around the ball and what it did that first flipper hit four different methods all four different tables so it was like yeah how are you gonna and these were nicely shopped tables too they weren't uh Mm -hmm. you know routed tables out in the public (laughs) totally so if you want to talk about the challenge i think that that you know, having a machine, having a machine that's in good shape, and then, and then realizing, hey, actually, we have two versions of the same machine, but they're not doing the same thing. What do we do with the game? That's that that's been a the biggest challenge, in my opinion, um, and especially when you know, try to make everybody happy, and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was when you guys first started with the machines. Now you've had a lot of times with these machines. Uh, are you typically, when when these machines come into the studio, uh, are you having to do a lot of service to them to get them up and running, or are they in fairly good working condition that you can just go off of that with? They're in fairly good working condition. Uh, but what does take a lot of time is uh, we, we break every single piece down, um, and then we, we model it and you know get it to, to size, and, and then... It takes a lot of time, so uh, that you know. But they're, they're not coming in. We're, we're never taking like a completely broken down machine that needs to be rebuilt. Um, although there, there, there's actually I shouldn't say that. There's there's one. There's one prize game that we're uh, that we found that is <laughs> broken down, and we're getting it back and working. Yeah. Oh, that's good, J- Jared. I, I feel we have a speculation podcast coming in our future on what that prize game will be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll, 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 down. Yeah. I'll, give, I'll give you guys the little, uh, yeah, <laughs> the, 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 the nod and the wink. <laughs> <laughs> um, so w- with with were you guys surprised at how long it took to do any of these uh, conversions? I mean, obviously, on the one hand. You're not having to create the layout. You're not having to create the story. You're not having to, you know, create any of the content that way. But just the sheer reassembling and then the emulation, I imagine, probably took a little bit longer than you guys were initially expecting. Uh, yes and no. There, there's things that I mean. So overall, I'm I'm really happy with with how the process has gone, and I thought it was going to take longer. Like my initial resource estimates. Um, were were much bigger than what we actually ended up needing in a, in a lot of regards. The things that are, are challenging, like getting our plastics, like the coloring on the plastics, uh, you know, was was uh, challenging. Um, also, the the, the pro physics um, it is actually it's a lot of work. That's why we haven't gone back through and, and added them yet into the other um, the the first what three packs? I yeah, think. three volumes. Um, yeah, so. Those those elements are, are have taken a lot of work, um, and it's hard to retroactively go back and tweak things that we've already done. And and it, I know it's, if you understand game development, you, you might not you might be like, oh, now you figured this out, just go back and push the button, make it all work the same. It, it, it's not like that. So um, those things take a while. But overall, I'm really happy with how efficient we've been. Um, and the, the team the team is awesome. I mean, these guys, you know, deep, and, and you know some of the guys on our yeah. on our team. They're they're just. I, you know, I'm just so so thankful for them that they love doing this and uh, and that they're so passionate about it and um, it's, it's a joy to work with them. The as there, I'm trying, I'm looking at my notes here. And it was just like, oh yeah, we just went over that. Um, the the yeah. has there been any I'm trying to cross and roll? Right, I know. It's like, wait, I got I gotta I gotta monitor the cameras. I gotta check this. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
There's a reason why I'm not on TV, folks. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) um, Touching on an old uh, touchy subject, the old uh, censorship of the uh, tables that's uh, basically with what consoles Mm. are dealing with, and we constantly get asked this, um, has there been any advancement uh, with that? And more to the point, because we were all speculating about this with the potential of Jackbot uh, being added into the, the table into the future, but that's entirely casino gambling um would they, is that kind of a reason why we haven't seen it yet and how are we doing with the censorship in general uh giving that as just an option to turn on and off on the uh, consoles so i can tell you this definitively that nothing is going to change with our esrb rating um for pinball fx3 so you're not going to see anything that'll fall outside of the scope of e10 plus on our current console platforms um, on PC, obviously, we, we figured out a solution um, yeah. on, on mobile, um, but right now on consoles, we, we can't make a, a change. So um, if, if a change will happen and the table will be fully uncensored, you, it would have to be something else entirely. And if we interpolate this, Jared, that means, well, let's see, he just said they're working on PS5 and an Xbox. New console, new rating! Oh, okay. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, let's uh, go on also just in terms of we have heard that uh, I know that uh, I think when we were talking to Deep uh, on one of these that yes alphanumerics are in the future um, that people don't have to worry about that because people are like oh my god we're not going to see them and then they all get all panicky because all that's left of the DMD is are obviously the licensed stuff um, but so we know that alphanumerics are coming in the future uh, what about something like Pinball 2000? I know that there's only two official releases uh, with the Star Wars and Revenge from Mars, and then the third that was almost finished, which was Wizard Blocks, and I know people have assembled fully working versions of those. Um, are those at all in the potential future with uh, Williams? Um, I, I'd just say, like, right now, that's not exactly our, our focus. Um, there's, other, there's other things that would be in front of, of those. So um, just to answer the question, honestly, I guess, like, it's not an immediate thing that we're doing. Um, there's a lot in front of that. Okay. Sounds None. like it's a bit of a some, someday maybe. <laughs> I won't if, rule it out, but I'll tell you, it, like, it's not in the next, like, six months or nine months. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's if we're scraping the barrel and we need something. Hey, look at that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's uh, move on a little bit over to the mobile side of uh, of the Williams app and just Zen in general. Um, you had mentioned, guy, this was back back when FX3 first came out, um, that the original plan was to eventually update the mobile app to be just like FX3. Um, and I'm assuming that was for the Zen side of things. Uh, since then, obviously, then you guys got Williams and all the focus has been on the Williams app. Uh, so the question is, will there ever be a similar uh, graphics and physics update to the Zen tables that are out there, even if it's not in an official FX3 mobile app? Or is there still things happening on the mobile side of things that kind of will uh, uh, update all those tables? Um, sorry, I, I maybe didn't completely follow. So will the mobile game look more like FX3 or will FX3 look more like the mobile game? No, will the mobile... So the current Zen app uh, with all the Zen originals on it, will that eventually get upgraded to look a little bit more like FX3, function more like FX3? Um, And because I know some of those tables uh, needed to... They're basically still FX2 models. They're not FX3 modeled um, kind of thing. So I'm just curious to know if if that's still on the, the... the table for all the Zen originals, or is it pretty much that's kind of frozen in time now? We're doing nothing but Williams uh, pinball app. Yeah, I'd say that's a little frozen in time, but there's but there's another uh, like a bigger force actually behind that. Um, as you know, the, the mobile <laughs> the mobile gaming market is massive. Like it, it's it's by far the leading. Uh, it's global. The most users, most devices. Brands have changed the way that they do things on. Uh, on mobile platforms and so you know Zen we were kind of grandfathered in so to speak with this like ability to have a platform with a bunch of IP in it now those same type of IPs 
want to be front and center. They want the app branded with their IP. They don't want to be behind something or, or side by side with something. So, you know, William, so you see our progression from Zen to Aliens, Bethesda, and, and then to Williams. You're more likely to see things on mobile that are all one IP, and the meta game is wrapped around that, and um, and it's just its own entity. So uh, on console and PC, it's still cool to have like a pinball platform and lots of stuff, but on mobile, the business is just run differently. Brands do things differently than they did back then. So there's a few things that work there. And then, you know, we've, we've done really well with Williams. Um, we can talk about that more if you like, but that's kind of the, the, where we are in terms of the strategy and the way things are, are progressing on mobile for us. Um, and brands have a lot to do with that, obviously, with, with our pinball games. Yeah, that's kind of where I was leading into, which is uh, the, the Williams app has gone through a couple of evolutions just within the terms of the pricing model, but it seems to have uh, found a, a steady uh, with probably the last three uh, releases that have gone on. Um, so I'm just kind of curious to know, is that pretty much the case that you've, you've found the sweet spot? This is where the uh, app is going to uh, kind of expected to be in terms of pricing and how it functions? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've progressed a lot in, in mobile. Uh, Williams is by far our, I would say like economically, it's our best producer in terms of when users come in, what do they do and what kind of return do we get for them? And I know that sounds horrible but i mean that's just the, the nature of mobile mobile games we mm -hmm. try not to we, we we try not to embrace the evil that is like it with you know i feel like in mobile gaming we still you know i, I think we hopefully we're finding a balance of it but the, the reality is people come in and this is for most people their primary gaming platform and they this is how they spend money this is how they play a game so we we have to we have to be successful there um, i know there's a segment of the market that and like you guys in you know this kind of player group that you just want to buy the game you just want to play you just give it to me um but sorry you guys are like a small fraction of the percentage of all the people on mobile so <laughs> yeah I, I mean like i think we started to realize that as as time went on like yeah. with the the variations in pricing and stuff like that in the app that you're like sort of experimenting with to find that the common ground it, it, it we, we quickly realized that it, mobile apps like even though like if you compare it to something like pinball arcade which had you know a buy it now dlc with no idea of like the um the freemium model um it, it's a very different type of business model and it's something that really isn't going to go away um, but doing it right is the really important part because as you probably would have found you know <laughs> certainly in the uh, the very tiny tiny segment that you know Chris and I fall into, and probably a lot of the fans fall into. Um, you probably would have got a fair bit of vocal feedback about some of the uh, the different experiments being run throughout the yeah, course. Yeah, totally. And you know, not to pivot this conversation suddenly, but I, that, this is why I really got behind Apple Arcade, and we put we put Dread Nautical out on on Apple Arcade. I feel mm. like this is a way that we can have really good games in a in a mobile environment that aren't trying to like do all the monetization gimmicks in the gotcha systems and all yeah. this and you can you can just pay a subscription and get access to all these great games that are like super high quality and you know for like that's the way that i would i love i would hope that more you know it goes more in that direction yeah it seems really interesting because you know you get to try the game out and if you like it you just keep playing it but if you don't you move on and find something else like it's it's pretty pretty good I think it's one of the best values in game, in like Xbox Game Pass, Apple Arcade, these kind of things where it's a monthly subscription and always new games and tons of stuff and things that you would never have tried. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that for me, if, you know, I, I, give, I can give my kid uh, her, her iPad and she just can play whatever she wants there. And I'm not worried that I'm going to get a bazillion in app purchase requests or <laughs> she somehow figured out how to spend oh, yeah. $500 on nothing. You know? <laughs> the so, credit card yeah. from hell. <laughs> berries. Buy the Smurf berries. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, speaking, though, with, with trying things out, and this has been a question that I've had personally and then trying to explain it to people, um, the pro physics and the visual enhancements that are in the Williams app, um, obviously you're not able to engage them until you've grinded for quite a while. And there's a lot of people that, if this is their only platform, they don't see what the big deal is. You know, why is everybody going nuts over the physics? Because they're not playing with the Williams physics. They're playing with the 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 more player friendly <laughs> version of the uh, the Zen physics, as, as we like to call it. Um, so the non pro version. Um, and I've always felt that 
it would be so beneficial to just give people that taste, give them that sample. Has there been any movement of, with the limited time events, which usually are only six days long, um, throwing that stuff in there so that people can get a taste of it so they know what they're actually grinding towards, um, you know, getting those those table parts for to understand what it is that they actually want to buy. So then if they want to purchase outright the Pro Pack, um, they know what they're spending their money on, basically. Yeah, this is going to sound really weird to you. The majority of those people don't want to play with pro physics. They it's oh. it's too difficult for them. They get frustrated. Um, they like the more gamey kind of floaty feel. So we've gone ahead with what what do the majority of people hopefully want it like we retention is the big thing. You want to keep people in the game. You don't want to churn users. So yeah. we found we we find that the majority and it's an overwhelming. It's in the ninety nine point something percentage. Um, wow. of, of people who play the game want to, they like, it's too hard for them on the, on the pro physics. And that's kind of a nature of pinball is it, it's a difficult game. It was designed to eat your quarters. Um, you're not, <laughs> sure. you know, so, um, I, I think of pinball as a mass market game. I, I look at it, people know it like Tetris and slots and I want them mm. to come into the game. I want them to feel good, have fun and stick around and hopefully spend some money. Um, but if they're enjoying themselves, that's great for the guys who want the more of the challenge. I mean, you know, if there was a way that we could just automatically put you into some bucket and say, all right, we know exactly who you are. I mean, we're working on that. There's AI technology that we're working on based on number of taps on, on, on the, the, you know, the phone and all these different things to know what kind of a player you are to maybe put you in a different bucket in the game that says you're going to get this stuff now. So, yeah. you know, these are possibilities, but I just say the overwhelming uh, overwhelming, overwhelmingly amount of pinball players that we have are just casual, casual. Yeah. fun people who love Star Wars or love Marvel. Um, the Williams app itself is maybe a little different because that's more nostalgic. These are people who grew up playing these games, but a lot of those guys, man, some of them are the really good players, but then they're going to hand it to their kid, and their kid now is playing a completely different way. So the AI gets messed up, right? Like, wait, oh, no, okay. you were this kind of player. What, what just happened? Now now you're a frantic, like you don't know what's going on and you can't, there's no time. Tell you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, these are your actual game design challenges. Okay. All right. That's really interesting. Uh, a suggestion from the uh, comment section here is that uh, because the app is getting quite large with the amount of tables that are there to unlock, um, is there a chance that you can maybe select which tables you want to focus on for getting the table parts, or is that still going to be just re relegated to when there's limited time event happening? I, I could talk with the guys who are managing the game. Um, that, that seems feasible, you know, um, and, and you're right. I mean, you, at a point you have, uh, what, what's the, the tyranny of choice? Right. <laughs> you guys know this one? Yeah, because we're at 18 uh, tables right now, and even that's yeah. starting to get, wait, which one do I want to actually play right now? <laughs> Yeah, um, that's the need for the random table, you know, random. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, when I when I go to buy toothpaste and it's my, and usually, you know, if I get stuck with that job and I'm like, uh, what toothpaste, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, see, yeah. this is this is actually uh, off the list of questions, but I remember you <laughs> discussing um, the uh, where you were doing Dave and Buster's testing on the, uh, the pimple cabinets. Um, mm -hmm. You were saying that it works better if you have less choice on those, because again, it's the, it's a whole, what toothpaste do I choose problem? Um, when oh, you're walking up to it. Um, I don't know if you could talk about how that's been going, like the, the site tests, but, um, uh, yeah, I, it's sort of, it's been quiet for a bit, but, um, yeah, I don't know. It is. Um, well, it, yeah, if we want to go into pinball machines now, uh, we, we totally can. Cause it's, I, mean, I can give you the, the full update. Is that, is that good? Do it. Okay. Yeah, do it. So to answer your question, yeah, we found that three pinball tables is the optimal amount. Um, and you also don't want to um, allow the user to have to scroll all the way all the way across. The, it's all out of view. It all needs to be in view at the same time. So all right. three of those have to rotate. Once it goes out of view and they start swiping back and forth, you, 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 you have run into a lot of problems from people accidentally starting a game that they didn't want to start or that are just spending a lot of time swiping. <laughs> so... Right. Uh, <laughs> So we found that three is the optimal. Let them choose on the screen. The tests are going uh, really well. We've we've been in, we're in casinos. We're in a Dave and Buster's. We're in a Mario and Dreddy uh, kart racing in Florida. We're in uh, some independent pizza locations, some barcades. We're in Logan's Arcade in Chicago. 
Um, I think, what are we at? We must be at 30 locations now with different form factors. Not all of them are the big, lit up, uh, crazy looking one. Some of them are the more standard looking game. Um, But we have some machines where they're they're turned on just totally free to free play. You don't don't spend any money. We have some which are credit credit card swipe or um, Apple Pay, Google Pay, wireless. Um, And then we have some which are redemption models. And all the data coming in is giving us, like, sending us in directions for how to basically support different business models and commercial locations. Um, right now, if you want to, if you're in a location, you can actually call Pinball Arcade up, and they'll give you, like, here's the three different options, the three different business models we can give you, and we will ship you the game, and it can be live in your location. So um, IAPA in Florida, that was in November, was kind of a, a big kickoff for that. We got a bunch of machines put in, and then, of course, this situation just happened where there's no, you know, no locations are shutting down and, and mm. you know, people are afraid to go out. So I, I assume our data is going to go completely flat um, here and for the foreseeable future. So we're probably going to see some delay, <clears throat> but we have been ramping. It's been a really nice ramp. We're getting good acceptance where we know it's a process because hardcore pinballers will come in and they'll be like, this is garbage. I'm never playing this. And then uh, a couple of days later, you find out they are playing it. Um, and, and they're having a great time. Um, so there's acceptance going on. There's people understanding what this is, what it, what we're trying to be, what we're not trying to be. Um, there's a lot to come uh, with that. With I think with our how we can do esports, how we can do global events, how we can do competition, how the pinball community can like bond and be connected in a in a fun community. So a lot to come still. And then you may have seen at CES uh, we we had an announcement with Arcade One Up. And, uh, yeah, we um, saw that. <laughs> yeah, just just a little bit of news. <laughs> yeah, I think we milked about uh, two or three podcasts out of that. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. <laughs> Be- before you go into that too, though, Mel, um, you know, I've I've got a large living room. I'd be happy to uh, you know offer plenty of data with one of those machines. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're not getting any play anywhere else, you know, whatever the one that's in Southern California, they can ship it right over here. (laughs) So, yeah, tell us about uh, tell us what you can about one up. (laughs) So, yeah, the thing with our arcade one up is really cool because, you know, so I saw pinball machines as like, first of all, the the whole thing is organic. Um, You know, we, we turned on vertical monitor support. It was an ask from the community on Steam. We turned it on. Um, so guys, could, so you guys can play with uh, your, your screens, you know, vertical orientation, the way pinball should be played. And then suddenly guys started building uh, machines in their in their garage. And then we had a guy in uh, a VP cabs. He decides, I want to make a business. He pitches Shark Tank. He gets a deal. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> it just like, I kept blowing my mind. I'm like, whoa, okay, maybe, you know, I never thought that this could really happen. But then it, sure enough, step by step, organically, it just started happening. Um, and I realized, I was like, you know, this could like really kind of close the loop on this ecosystem that we've built. We've got console, PC, mobile, uh, we have VR, and now we've got a physical presence. Like, in the game of pinball, like I said, it's like a Tetris slot style thing. Everybody wants to play. Everyone wants to play on every device. Pinball is a, a machine to begin with. Um, and there's always been two things that have uh, blocked mass market pinball machine adoption. I, like, guys, we all want every pinball machine in our house, right? Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Anybody who's listening to this right now, anybody a part of our community, um, you know, I have a fishtails machine. It's broken down. It's not working. And when it is, it breaks down again. Yes. Um, so, you know, you have a, a uh, like a, and it's big. It, it's really big. I have it in my garage. I can't fit it in my house. But if we could solve the size issue, make it so it doesn't take up a huge amount of space. And then the price. Most guys, you know, you can find something for six grand. Um, Brand new ones at eight and a half and above, some maybe a little lower, depending on what's going on. So you got size and space. Arcade went up, came to us um, with uh, a great prototype, and we saw that, holy cow, you guys have solved space and price. And maybe now it's available for people who want to own pinball machines to, to have one. And so we've been working on getting the feel as authentic as possible. Of course, it's running our software, which we're very proud of. Um, with Star Wars and Williams so far being announced. Um, and, you know, these are going to be sold at Walmart and Target and Costco and big box stores with Amazon. I'm hoping that we can really, you know, give people that real authentic pinball experience that they've been waiting um, and maybe couldn't afford before and in the space that they didn't have. So 
I'm really personally excited about it, and I think it's I think it's a real game changer. Can you uh, tell us by any chance what I know that the prototypes are running the Steam version of games, but I don't expect that they're going to put a computer into into uh, their cab. Do you know is it going to be a mobile uh, platform like Android running it, or is it a, something completely custom software built uh, that's going to be running these games? Um, so actually, Chris, right now I I can't confirm with you okay. what version we're, we're going with. Um, we're going to make that call. So we're we're testing a lot of different things, and it's there's an intersection of price and quality and mm. there's, there's certain benchmarks that we're not willing to go below. I can tell you, we don't want anything below 50 frames per second. Yep. You know, and that, that's, that's the big one because we all know pinball sucks. If it, if it goes below that, we did ideally yep. 60 FPS. Um, and you know, the, the graphical quality has to be there. And, um, and then, you know, there, there's a lot we can do. Um, this first go around, you're not likely to have a lot of like online features and connection and everything, but gen two, or maybe between gen one and two, we can turn on a really, really awesome, engaging, fun community um, presence and ability for these machines to like be really alive. Um, and that's what excites me. You know, I, I love to play games with my friends and I have a lot of people who always want to play pinball with me. But um, if I know that, like I have a, like a machine and I just jump on it and it's cool and it's fun. Like I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to ditch my controller. I'm going to ditch my, my iPad and I'm going to be playing that baby all night long. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm sort of thinking with, with what you're seeing in uh, your location testing at the moment that I, I fully expect a lot of those lessons you're learning there are probably going to translate into generation two of the um, arcade one-up cabinets as far as community and, and the ability to like play online and these things that may or may not happen. But I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, the data you're already collecting out there in the field will surely inform those decisions. It absolutely is. Um, it, because, you know, we, I know when we get together on these calls, we come up with all sorts of cool ideas and, and like things that are possible. And that's totally true. You start to put it into actual practice and maybe you build a feature um, you, you throw it out there, you see what sticks, and then, you know, everybody, this is what everybody's doing now in the game, and so you want to build that out. We mm -hmm. are, we're getting all those data points. We're getting, we're, we are being data-driven. We want to give the most amount of enjoyment to the most amount of people. Um, and so having machines in the field are absolutely contributing to our ability to deliver a really fun in-home experience uh, for people. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, like right now, with just with the prototype and Obviously, games like Attack from Mars don't need a plunger. Um, but is that something that maybe we can expect to see also uh, wind up coming to some of these one-up cabinets? Uh, as certain tables don't have just an automatic launch, they're going to need the plunger for skill shot kind of uh, base play anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, can't again, not confirming hardware spec or anything. Yeah. But there's always a touch. There's a touch screen possibility. There's a button. Um, and the button could also be the, you know, the launch button could be a magnet save too. Um, or on, you know, I don't, whether there's one on the, on the side, like if you have two buttons, the flipper, the magna, um, there's different configurations right now, um, that we're, we're, we're nearly final. And then once it's all final, like, I don't, the, the worst thing I could do is like spit something out and then we change it. So yeah. I don't want to save until it is locked. Right. the form factor is locked. We know it's going in the box. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but basically, um, it's it's these yeah. are all things that you guys have obviously been thinking about and trying to figure out uh, what what needs to go where and why lock, and how. <laughs> yeah, lock bar. How does it feel? Uh, the width of the thing, the height, the the angle of, of the the screen. I mean, like the DMD positioning. All these things have gone through so many iterations and prototyping and different phases. Um, I, you know, in our work that we did with the commercial machines, sped up because we you know we announced this thing in January. We're launching this year. And so, uh, mm. if we didn't do all this work in the commercial side, I, I think it, we, I mean, we would have been starting from scratch in zero. So, my, back from the very beginning of my story, when we just turned on vertical monitor orientation, it's led us all the way now to like this point. Physical and, pinball. Yeah. 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 yeah um, this, Who would have thought, hey? Cool. Like, <laughs> would have thought that that would have been where you ended Sam up. Sam is a software company. Like, we we make we make pinball software, you know. Um, yeah. And now we've got we've got capable partners who see the potential on the hardware side. You know, it's, it's I, funny though, because didn't Mel, didn't you start at Red Octane doing controllers, <laughs> you know, DDR pads and stuff like that? 
Yeah. <laughs> See, so it's it's coming full circle for you. <laughs> oh yeah. I can tell you guys. Yeah. Oh yeah. I got some great stories, but back in those days, uh, in the groove with with dance pads, and then Guitar Hero, uh, obviously with, with lots of guitars, leading into Rock Band with uh, with drums and, and drums. different pieces. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of experience on the hardware side. <laughs> but Zen is a software company. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. You're you're not getting into the hardware business. You're gonna let others uh, do that. Um, something that we speculated about, and I don't know how much you can touch upon this or not, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Uh, we kind of figured that with One Up, they're clearly gonna have to be licensing. Like, especially look at the Star Wars table with all the Star Wars art on it. They're gonna have to be securing licensing with uh, Lucasfilm, as you guys already had licensed with Lucasfilm. Do you feel that there's any licensing that kind of uh, that they've been able to secure that's going to help you secure stuff in the future also. Sorry, I kind of... Uh, it sounded like we had we have like uh, some cool sound effects going on back there. Could you... Oh, that one? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I think the weed whacker was uh, happening in the backyard for Jared. Um, <laughs> what I was basically saying is, obviously, 1UP uh, and their parent company is going to have to be securing licensing uh, for, like, say, for with putting out the Star Wars machine. Um, you know, they have to secure all that licensing to be able to sell that, have all the, the artwork there. You guys already had the Star Wars license with your tables. Um, and I, I always point this towards with like what they just did with NBA Jam. Well, that would work wonderfully because it's almost the exact same license it would be necessary for, say, NBA Fast Break on the pinball side of things. Do you feel that, that the two of you are going to be able to kind of uh, combine your licensing efforts to really go after larger properties that uh, might otherwise have been in cost prohibitive for any one company to, to handle? Yeah, Chris, you're, you're seeing the situation perfectly clear. Um, Tastemakers yeah, is a parent company for our K1UP. Um, Scott uh, Bacharach, their, their CEO, has a tremendous amount of experience in licensing um, and has made like tons of toys. And, and the guy is awesome. He's a visionary. It's been it's been a thrill to like, I, I've been in rooms now with, with him, John D. Jolt, uh, who was the founder of Zen, and m- myself and the four of us just like start spitballing ideas and you're just like, wait a minute, this is all possible. Um, I think that you'll see collaborations between the two of us that probably couldn't have happened um, if it was just one of us trying to do it. Um, and that's on the licensing side, the type of games that we can make. And now our opportunity that we can provide to licensors is is bigger. You know, we can give them a, a retail presence in a, in, a, in a product that they can, you know, physically see and, and gives them a different dimension to the business and our pitch to them. Um, and for us, uh, of course, we're software. But you know, now we've, we've just got a different. We've got the, the, the physical and the digital. Uh, I might say we we're kind of driving the entire pinball space right now. Mm. No, I don't doubt that. <laughs> yeah. So for all of you who think that Zen's not interested in pinball yeah. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, there's something to be said there. Um, once upon a time, uh, back in the FX2 days when I was playing it on the PS3, uh, we were able to do, it wasn't head-to-head pinball, but it was kind of like you could score races and uh, uh, time races where you could see the other person's uh, meter kind of going across. It never made its way over to Steam, and I understand there wasn't much excitement of it at the time. Fast forward to today, though, especially with us all being locked away at home, and it's like, oh man, what I would do to be able to go head-to-head hot seat with somebody online. And I know that uh, this is something that the guys over Magic Pixel have worked out. I was wondering, is there any chance, momentum, uh, glimmer of hope that Zen might be working on something similar? Yeah, um, and I had to, I had to be careful about this because um, of things that are in the works. I have an official statement to read to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> doesn't doesn't get more safe than that, but let's go. <laughs> yeah. Even if I cannot divulge anything confidential, we are currently evaluating several very exciting game modes that fall into the online play category. If not necessarily online hot seat head to head play, trust me, we have certainly some quite awesome game mode ideas in store for the future to come. That <laughs> that, that was very legalese. <laughs> that was very very very. That would have been visited a number of times, I'm sure. Look, I don't think I've ever given you a, a answer like that before. So I've, <laughs> I've, there, now I've done it. We have a first. But you know what? Right. I like it all the same because, again, it just it's speculation, uh, rumor mill fodder for us. Um, because you know, it, it's better than going no. <laughs> yeah, and also, you know, if you're being that particular about it, 
there's probably a very good reason for <laughs> it, which we will uh, try and extrapolate in future shows. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we want to keep some, you know, we always got to keep our edge, right? And uh, yeah, there's great absolutely. pinball competition out there, but I don't want to go too much into what we're doing because it's enough. cool. Really, really cool. <laughs> <Wait to see. laughs> um, <laughs> obviously, when, you know, if you even go back five years uh, ago, uh, we thought that we were in a pinball kind of peak. Stern Pinball uh, with our machines was also doing great. Uh, Jersey Jack Pinball was coming out. Um, we all thought that that was kind of like, oh, hey, we're, we're entering a new, a new renaissance. Now you look at today, and that seems quaint. Uh, and by that's what the physical side of things, but obviously the digital side of things has multiplied immensely. Where do you see this kind of going in you know, five years from now? Oh, that, that's a good question. Um, and we can look at history to maybe tell us that, like you just said, five years ago, what you thought was big, and now here we are. It's That seems small. But, I mean, pinball is a game that's been around longer than we've been alive. Um, mm. And uh, and that's amazing, you know, because not many, there's not many things that we can say that about. And that today it's more relevant than ever, and it's bigger than ever. Um, I, I think that um, – so Asia is a really interesting place – for us to try to figure out how to make pinball relevant and we can see it happening. And I think when we add in the world's largest population centers to uh, pinball acceptance and adoption and enjoyment, um, the opportunities are massive and immense. I think the game of pinball itself might have to have a little different look and feel to it for those places. So we might start, we might say, whoa, this is like an, a brand new way to play pinball. It, it's, it's a ball and flippers, but it plays differently or it looks differently. Um, you know, you can see pachinko like with the Japanese. They love pachinko. It's a cultural thing. Mm. Um, you know, uh, in China, they actually like Stern has done really well. They're getting uh, pinball machines into China, and, and we see the Chinese really loving pinball. Um, Korea, not quite so much yet. Um, Southeast Asia, Thailand, and Malaysia, and Indonesia, and Singapore. And, you know, some of these emerging markets like India. I mean, God, imagine when they figure out what pinball is. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's where I I see it going. I see, like, so far, North America and Europe, um, with our population size, you know, China alone is bigger than North America, than USA and Europe combined by, like, two times. So we have a lot of people that are going to be coming in, and the game might look a little different, might play a little different. They have different technology. There's new technology that we're intersecting. And pinball is always a game that, like, is always first a platform because it's the thing that people know and understand and they, you know, every new store, every new device wants to have a pinball game or it's not complete. Um, and so I just think it's just going to be so much bigger. Um, that's all I can, that's, that's what I think is going to happen. Okay. I, I certainly think that with the introduction, just seeing how good uh, one has been doing with their arcade cabinets, once we heard these three-quarter scale pinball cabinets, uh, to me it was just like, that's going to m- cause a huge jump uh, just from people that it's that cool factor. It's not going to take up a lot of space. They're going to have a lot of games on these things, and the price point's not the cost of what these typical virtual cabinets were. Um, I certainly see that as it's going to cause another boom of of sorts. Yeah, I, I see it as well, like Chris. Like the the whole you know arcade furniture, I think is what they're calling it at the moment in 2020, is it seems to be a thing that's going to be huge. And, you know, just think of the impact that you'd see walking into a Walmart or a Costco and you see this box covered in Star Wars livery and you see pinball on it and you go, I, I have to have one of those. Like, it's it's just the, the attractiveness of it is is almost overwhelming, I think. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this segment performs in 2020. I'll tell you guys a little thing, you know, in back in 2007, Zen released Pinball FX and um, Microsoft was shocked because we were like the number one Xbox Live uh, game for years and years. My- Minecraft finally dethroned us. And um, it- it's always it- it's like always been this game that's kind of like under the radar. But I- I'm I think it was like when we when we had the 10 year anniversary of Pinball FX, I was shocked. I was like, we are the original game as a service. We are the original free platform download within app purchasing. Um, I can't believe we're still working on this thing after so many years and it's bigger <laughs> than ever. You know, in, and now, I mean, like uh, industry trends and like the evolution of video games themselves have actually been patterned after things that Zen did first. And I can't believe that. Right. And 
it, I, and I just think that there's something inherent about pinball surviving for that long because it's like the game. It's like it's like the the um, survival of the fittest, and pinball is that game. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah. And I and I think you know it's, it goes back to the whole passion. So long as you guys have a passion for it, um, it yes. conveys it's, it's kind of into, into it game. translates into the game itself. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And we all see it, and that just keeps our passion going forward too. And it's like. Uh, we're there for the evolution to go forward with it and uh, happy to be along for the ride wherever you guys take us. Mm. Yeah. And I, I listened to one of your podcasts recently and it was the one maybe where you're talking about um, like what the heck is going on. There's no news from anybody. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yep. We have, that's where we like, talk about and stuff, like, and <laughs> stuff and things. Stuff and things. Trademark. <laughs> And no, I mean, I, and I've found, you know, Zen has found itself in a position and, and I'm I mean, like myself, I don't consider myself to be like, I mean, like I'm the pinball ambassador or whatever, but I have a responsibility to get on here, stoke the fire, let everybody know that, hey, don't worry, nothing's dying, no one's going away from this, like we are, we're in it for the long haul, we got a lot of exciting stuff, and uh, I wanted to come on and like, you know, cheer everybody up a little bit. Well, uh, I think you've done just that. Um, again, I think sure you've has. given us a lot of stuff to uh, to discuss in the future. It's good to know that uh, uh, things haven't come to a standstill at all, and that instead you're busier than ever. So, I mean, it's great. Yeah. I think um, I'm just reading through the notes, because I've been crossing them off diligently as I've been going along. I think we might have two hanging notes um, that I think we haven't covered. One oh. of those is being it's a, a question about um, control support for iOS. Any oh, yeah. idea about what's happening there? Okay. Yeah. And this is, uh, thank you for sending uh, this question because I had to get, let's see, we have it on our radar, not necessarily for the near future. Um, there's cool things going on in the background, um, which are consuming our time. So it doesn't, let's see, right. I, w- I will say this, um, you know, I mentioned Apple Arcade, right? So like yep. one of the mandatory requirements of being on Apple Arcade is controller support. So right. um, there you go. Fair enough. Yeah. That's a, a fair thing to say. <laughs> um, the other thing, Chris, what, what that means is that it's event that the pinball games are eventually going to be on uh, on Apple Arcade, Jared. That's translation yeah. there. Uh, go ahead, Jared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, got it, got it. Roger Wilco. Um, <laughs> Somebody would have figured that out. I didn't need to say it. So. No, that's right. Exactly right. So um, the other one I think was, and if, uh, I don't think we covered this one either. Is there um, is there any idea of time frame again? This is probably down to the fact you guys are rather busy at the moment. But um, is there a desire or a time frame um, to get uh, volumes one to three with the uh, the newer physics that we've seen in the later packs on Williams Pinball? Yes. Um, there's actually an initiative to get pro physics on every Zen Studios pinball table. Right. Every Zen? Oh, wait, wait. That, like even every the originals, reason. yes? Yes. Even uh, Zen original IP, our licensed stuff. We, we get it like so on the console PC side we see the value of the pro physics and we know we that's what this player group wants um, so I mean it, it's a like I said it, it's not a just push a button retroactively do it it's an immense amount of work but it is it's a top initiative it's it's at the very top of the list that's really good all right I'm Jared saying. that was that was worth it right there just for that I don't care what else mm-hmm. was said I'm happy <laughs> <laughs> Exactly right. That's, you know, uh, that's good news indeed. The the only other thing, Jared, that I saw that uh, was on our list of uh, things that we kind of wanted to touch upon was uh, tournaments within oh, yeah. FX3. Um, obviously, you can create your own tournament, um, but as has been popping up on Reddit with people hosting their own tournaments where it's multi-table uh, kind of tournament situations, and there's no way of doing that currently within FX3. Um is there a way of kind of implementing that kind of thing within FX3, or is that something that has to be saved for whenever the next iteration of everything happens? Um, yeah, I think that that would have to be next iteration, um, you know, a forward-looking thing. I don't think we're going to... So, again, I have a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. I, I start to know when I start to walk up to the edge, and I'm like, okay, stick with Wait, me. Oh. Just take a step the power, back, the power and ingenuity of the community is always astounding and humbling. And at the same time, at the same time, grassroots tournaments extending on the built-in feature set is just one of the most striking examples of what a dedicated pinball community is capable of. And while we cannot promise a direct support for this just yet, these are all still amazing things. 
<laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> I'm going to go over here to the comments real quick. This is one we didn't forward to you, and it is something that I'm interested in in uh, from the home market. But the question is, will official backlasses, active or passive, from Arcade 1-Up be added to FX3? In other words, are we going to see any time animated backlasses that can be on a second monitor for those of us with cab setups? Good question. Um, don't know how to answer that at the moment. I okay. do know that... <laughs> no, no, you didn't have time for the official statement on that one. <laughs> yeah, there's, really, there's a lot of good... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of good community created stuff now for the back glasses on, on cabinets. And we're fine even with our IP, not just to kind of let that happen um, with even third party IPs. They seem to be like, hey, they're enjoying our artwork. It's up on their screen. I'd rather them be looking at ours than something else. So it's oh, generally, sure. you know, those are okay. As far as what we can do um, on arcade one up machines, um, again, it's do we do we want to bite the, you know, like, can we do a cost effective second monitor up there now? And how, how do we feed it? Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's back in the prototyping. It's back in what is the final form factor. Um, and, and how does that look? And, and I don't want to like, again, say something that is unconfirmed at this point, but sure. look, that makes a better pin cap experience. Um, it would be awesome in games, you know, it's totally worth it for us to, to figure that out. And it's, it's whenever we talk about pin cabs in, um, features, Back glass is always a big part of that discussion and how to make them dynamic. So, sure. Because I know it's one of those things where I didn't pay hardly any attention to it at all because I didn't have a setup that could that could run uh, cabinet mode. And now that I do, all of a sudden I'm like going, oh, this is what everybody was commenting about in the past. I mean, I went to the point that I went and I wasn't happy with the back glass kind of situation for the second monitor. I did a whole pack. We did a whole episode about that where I did every single Zen table that was out there and put it out there. And it was like, okay, I hope the same artwork's available whenever the next originals come out because I'm going to need to have a consistency. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But um, all right. I think that's actually it. That is about it. Finally exhausted the questions. <laughs> We we did, and uh, we even got some bonus stuff out of uh, out of Mel there that we weren't anticipating. So, uh, mm. unless there's anything else Very you want nice. to uh, spit at us uh, there, Mel, uh, I think we're we're at the end here. Yeah. Cool. No, I just you know always like to say thank you to you guys. Uh, you you do a fantastic job, and uh, I know you guys get to like beta test our tables, and you help us out a lot. So I really appreciate that, and then. Anybody who's listening and stuck with Zen since 2007 by chance, you know, that's a long time to hang out together. Um, and we appreciate your support. And thanks for uh, thanks for sticking with us. Absolutely. Well, uh, again, thank you, Mel, for uh, coming on. We know you're, uh, even in this time, you're, you're crazy busy. Uh, we just happened to luck out that you weren't uh, traveling anywhere. Um, so, yeah, for, for me and Jared, Jared... Uh, I don't know when our next podcast is, but we've certainly got uh, fodder to talk about uh, <laughs> in that next podcast. Uh, mm. Yeah, definitely a lot of stuff and things to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> as is always the case. All right, folks, uh, as usual, make sure you follow us on the uh, Twitters uh, and uh, make sure you follow Zen, too, because there's a ton of stuff that we get from there ourselves. So uh, mm. at Zen Studios, at Pinball, uh, I think it's at Pinball Effects. Um, yep. But uh, and then Mel is uh, at uh, Mel J Kirk, I believe. And Mel G. Yeah. Mel G Kirk. Mel G. There we go. Mel G. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. Until then, uh, thank you so much, Mel, and uh, we'll see y'all again soon. Bye bye. Okay. See you later. See ya.